All right, hey everybody, I am Lindsay Cuyava. There are some new faces here, so I'm just gonna introduce what this is and um, we'll kind of go from there. But yes, like I said, my name is Lindsay Cuyava. I am the Artistic Director of Re Theater. We are an online theater education and consulting company and our whole goal is to help educators make art that matters by using their theater programs as an opportunity for community engagement. Um, and I mean, I just love musical theater. And so any way that we can find to help our students students bring the magic of theater education alive on the stage and in our communities, we're all here for. Um, and so we have been hosting this month a series of brainstorming um, events on Wednesdays, whereas educators were just holding a space for anyone that is interested in coming and chatting and talking about how we navigate this super fun time we're all in where we're trying to teach a subject that is never meant to be online. Um, and so we want to just have this space um, and we've been focusing on different uh, subjects throughout the month. If this is your first time joining us and you are interested, please let me know. Um, I am happy to share some of the other, not some of, I'm happy to share all of the other brainstorms that we've done. So we started out with a brainstorm around lighting, sound, and set design. Um, we did one on character development and a little bit of script analysis um, and scene work. And then we did last week's was on costume design and stage management. Um, that week, last week was super interesting and fun. Um, we had the, uh, I can never remember his exact title, but he works at um, Wesleyan in Illinois. He's one of the costume shop managers over there, um, Kyle Pingle, and he had super great ideas for how we can be doing costume design um, in a way that's like, not just make a Pinterest board, congrats. Um, so yeah, so today we are going to be talking about everything dramaturgy, which is like my jam and my favorite thing because that's what I do in the world. Um, and so I'm really, really excited. I know most people don't get this excited about dramaturgy, but hopefully this enthusiasm will make you want to teach dramaturgy with your students. So um, before we go ahead and jump into everything, um, I would just like to open up the floor if anybody wants to share what if anything has been going well for you or anything that's like been positive or if there's like some struggles you're having i love the fact that we're a bunch of educators here together and so i want to like give you guys some space where you can be with other adults who um do the same thing as you rather than with children online or with your family which maybe are not all theater artists so uh, if anybody has anything they'd like to share how they're feeling things that are working now is the time and you're welcome to do so I always really love this when I like have to pause. The awkward way. Um, yes. <laughs> we're doing a our first ever verbatim theater project in one of my classes and we're just starting and I'm really excited but also a little freaked out that the first time we're doing this I can't see kids or like be there 25 or 7 but that's exciting and we're doing online auditions and stuff so making the online game work. I love that. Are you doing verbatim theater? Are they doing stuff around, are they collecting interviews and everything? Or like how, mm -hmm. are they yeah. kind of like around what's happening in the world right now? Yep. So yeah, they wanted to create a, sh a show like using perspectives of what's happening right now was what they wanted to explore, which I'm sure a ton of us are doing stuff like that right now. Um, I am so excited about that, Alyssa. <laughs> Hopefully it does well. Yeah, no, I think that's wonderful. And next month, um, we're actually going to have um, the director of the NYU Verbatim Lab come on and do a brainstorm. And he also just joined Spotlight, Alyssa. So he would be a really great Ooh. person to connect with um, because, yeah, he is magical and wonderful. And I'll actually put the link to the Verbatim Lab um, in, the, in the chat at some point here today so everybody can Thank check you. it out. Yeah, because the Verbatim Lab, if you aren't familiar with it at NYU, they um, they have a bunch of online resources where they take moments. So one of their big ones is when the incident with Serena Williams, where she got like all like disqualified from a match or something. I'm remembering the details wrong. But what they do is they take actual moments and they do the Anna Devere Smith, um, the whole like uh, transcription thing and so it's the everybody says it in the exact same amount of time with the exact same pauses every, the same movements 
And they took, they took this moment and they did, they swapped around Serena Williams, um, her gender and her ethnicity. And so you watch the same thing with a white man, with a black man and with a white woman. And it's like, fascinating and it calls so many biases up without being like hey guess what you're racist um so it's a really interesting project to do with your students so i'll be sure to put that in the chat and it also is like slightly aligned with what we're going to talk about today anyways um thank you for sharing that Alyssa. does anybody else have anything else they want to share i'll go <gasps> wonderful hi um so i actually just got off a zoom call with um my like top dog staff members, my office manager, the guy that's been like doing all my video editing, which is like, I couldn't live without him right now. He's like, yeah. oh, no problem. And it just like looks fabulous. I don't know. Um, but we, I just decided officially, I haven't told my, my cast yet, but we were supposed to be performing Aladdin Kids um, with Festival International, uh, which is a huge music festival in my town of Lafayette, Louisiana. And so we um we were supposed to be doing that last weekend and this weekend and clearly that's not happening so we you know we've been searching for a new venue new dates uh we we sent out a survey to the kids nobody can agree on a date i'm like what are we gonna do oh yeah so, uh, we are going to film it from home and the ideas are that we are, if there's only four kids in a scene, we'll just Zoom with those four kids. We'll read the scene. I'm challenging the kids to make their costumes. Um, I'm going to drive around town and drop off props and costumes that I already have. Um, if, if uh, like, let's say you need to hand off a loaf of bread to someone, we're going to try to make it look like you're, you know, catching and receiving it on the screen. Um, we're just really trying to, like, make the kids excited about it. And I think it's going to be really cute. So... So the scenes are gonna be filmed via Zoom. We're gonna have the kids record their voices using headphones so that it's just like a clean acapella um, track of them singing. We're gonna take all of them, we're gonna dub them like on top of each other, make a choir sound. We're gonna do the dances on Zoom and then put the voices <laughs> on the video. I mean, it's gonna be a ton of work, but they'll oh have this like musical um forever uh they can keep it forever and i think it's just like our way of making the most of this crazy time oh my gosh i love that that is so interesting and such a cool way to make this all happen in hey. this chaotic world so yeah i mean like i can't sell tickets but like it's fine we'll just we'll survive we'll, we'll make we it work brainstormed a bunch of options or ideas for like online summer camps like rather than calling them camps calling them like challenges and yeah creating like a box of like a monologue and um a scene and a craft project and like things that we would normally do at summer camp creating a box if you sign up for summer camp we'll send it to your house we'll do a weekly class or we'll do the class for the week and then have like a list of challenges and oh. as you send in your video of like yourself completing the challenge you get points and then if you earn enough points, you get a prize in the mail or a prize or something like that to where we're keeping kids engaged and motivated to do things um, at home. Oh my gosh. I am so obsessed with this. Allison, I would love to talk to you more about your online thing too. Okay. Okay. Um, I have some, I have a couple questions for you. Okay. I'm really um, excited. Was, and I like literally yesterday I was crying. I'm, I was like oh. a mess yesterday. And today I'm like on fire again. So I, was, I wanted to share that with y'all. Thank you so much. Awesome. Anybody else have anything else before we jump in? All right, let's go ahead and jump in. So a couple of you guys, we've had a couple more people join. So just one last comment. If you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves over in the chat, um, you can just say who you are, where you teach. If you want to say what areas you teach, um, like what specific subjects, that'd be great. Um, but let's go ahead and chat about dramaturgy. So as we go through this, um, we will, um, we'll have you guys go ahead if you have questions put them in the chat. Um, and then we will obviously have a lot of discussion as well. So I'm gonna talk for like 15 minutes-ish about dramaturgy um, and just some overarching ideas. And then we'll go go on in there. Um, uh, yeah, great. So 
also just as a just as an uh, aside, if you're asking me questions as I'm going through, I'm going to try really hard not to look at the chat because then they become very spacey and I forget what I'm saying. So I will go look over there at some point. But if there is something immediate that you want me to clarify, feel free to um, to unmute yourself. So. Great. All right. Well, I am so excited. So many of you guys are here today to talk about dramaturgy because, as I said, it is my absolute favorite thing. Um, and right now, with go being online, this is a perfect time to start using dramaturgy with our students. And I also think that this is a perfect time to actually get our students excited about dramaturgy because so many students and so many humans don't actually understand the value of digging deeper into the material that we're doing. So theater is an amazing, wonderful tool that can bring so much joy into our lives and provide so many amazing opportunities for the young people that are participating in it to gain so many skills like public speaking and community building and problem solving and all those things that we, we tout around of why theater education is important. But one thing that I wish that we would focus more on is the fact that theater actually allows us to understand human connections and to understand how um, societies work and how human dynamics work and how those things all then intertwine to tell stories. Um, so when we're gonna talk about dramaturgy today, there's going to be a mix of both like traditional dramaturgy from like what you probably did in, in college and maybe you had a whole class on dramaturgy, maybe you just had a, a quick unit. So we're gonna take some of that traditional stuff and then apply it with applied theater. Um, so the idea of how do we then take that out into the community and apply theater um, with, within, in our, within our areas. Um, so the first thing I just want to start by talking about is this idea that dramaturgy is the foundation for everything that we do with our students. Um, every single age group can be doing dramaturgy of some sorts. And our goal as educators should be able to find ways to excite our students to go beyond what they are just presenting on the stage to find out more of what's actually happening underneath the service. And so I'm really, I think the biggest thing that we, when we're looking at, at dramaturgy and at the work that we're doing, it has to start with us. And so we need to go through the script and find out a couple of things. So the first thing that you always want to make sure there's a couple of areas that we're going to start in. So you always want to make sure that you understand who wrote this script, why they wrote this script, when they wrote this script, and what they are trying to say or what, what their original intent behind the show was. Sometimes this will take a lot of like digging around for you to find this, um, especially if it's some of the more um, hmm, like jukebox musical, and um, and movie musicals that are really right now we're seeing this like whole trend towards just a lot of like corporate musicals and maybe not as much of a social minded um, background on these shows, but you can always find this information. If you cannot find this information, then it becomes up to you to figure out um, the only thing that you wouldn't maybe be able to find here is the why behind why they wrote it. If you can't find that, um, that's okay, then you have to do that answer as well. Um, so once you're able to answer those questions, then it becomes your responsibility as the educator to then put your own lens on top of that material. So you should never, we should never be like trying to copy Broadway, right? That's a huge disservice for our kiddos because they aren't professional dancers. They aren't professional singers. They're not professional actors. And so we should be finding ways to have this work reflect their skills, their abilities, and their community. Um, and so when we, once we have our initial research done, I encourage you to think about why you need to tell this story now, how you will make this story different um, from the original, and what you are trying to say to your community. Um, these are really important things. There was, um, I was just teaching a class with some students and we were talking about the musical Next to Normal. Um, if you are not familiar with Next to Normal, just bear with me for one minute, but it was a really great example. With Next to Normal, there's so many avenues that you can take to go into that show. You could be taking a specific 
um, stance on mental health and on medication. You could be taking a specific stance on relationships, but my students, they, one of the best examples that students came with was the idea of what it means to escape um, and the different ways that the characters in the show escape their reality. Um, and so this is a way for us as directors to find a unique voice that really works with what our students are looking for. For example, if you're going to do something like Brigadoon, I don't know too many high school students that are like, Brigadoon, sign me up. You know what? That's like my favorite jam. Love some old music with weird ghosts and just confusion everywhere. I mean, I love Brigadoon. Um, but the ways that we can start to get our students excited is by having that very clear um, point of view as we go into it. Um, everything that I just spoke about, um, I there's a worksheet that I will at the end tell you where that you can find it, um, but it takes you through this whole um, dramaturgical applied theater meshed protocol um, to help you better understand your the reasons behind the work you're doing. Um, so as we go into that, um, the other thing that I think is really important when we start to figure out how we are going to set up our dramaturgy protocol for our students is to better understand our audience. And so we're going to pause on audience for just a moment. Um, there is a wonderful article um, out that I'm probably, I'm sure probably almost all of us have read because it's been out for like three years. It floats around every few months. And it's basically this article, or I can't remember the exact title, but it was in the Washington Post. And it was about this mom who was appalled at a show that her students were participating in in high school. And she goes through this whole journey to figure out why she was appalled and came to this whole conclusion of that theater is supposed to be like more than just family friendly. And one of the sources that she cites is, um, is, is Howard Sherman um, and his idea of audience. Um, if you're not familiar with Howard Sherman, he is the former executive director of the American Theater Wing, and he also runs the, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, of course this is happening because I just forgot the exact, um, the arts, artistic integrity, it's something, in, I will look this up and put it in the notes, um, but it's, it's an arts integrity organization out of the new school, which their whole focus is to help schools navigate issues of censorship. Um, so if that ever is something that you run up against where your, your parents are like, well, of course you can change this aspect of the show, or of course you can change this word or anything. And you're like, but actually we can't. And then they're like, well, we're going to shut you down. This is a great institute to con uh, an, a service to connect with. It's always free and they work with your communities. And I have worked with them a few times and I will say that they are absolutely amazing at being able to talk to anybody from any background without it being like a whole like culture war type thing, which these conversations tend to happen. Um, so his idea around audience is that there is five concentric circles that create this. And when we are doing high school theater, we need to be thinking specifically about audience in a unique way from away from commercial theater and even away from community theater. So, if we look at this model, so the first, the smallest and most important circle that's the closest to what we need to do is we need to be thinking of shows that connect to our students. And so we need to find show that is focused on them as an audience member. The second circle is going to be anyone who is involved in the production. Um, so that would be yourself. That would be your staff. Um, and so you guys are the second most important when we're coming up with this idea of audience and, show, and selecting shows. The third circle is, is your school community. Like who is in the immediate community of your school? Because we have to consider what would be important for our students to learn and to be able to connect with in our shows. The fourth circle is going to be our community at, or the community that is likely to come see our show. So that's going to be parents, friends, family members, all of those folks. And finally, the least important of this is going to be our community at large. So like the people, and this is the thing that sucks the most, you know, those people who email you and are like, well, I actually have none, of, nobody in my family is involved in your theater program. And I actually never go to theater, but I have a lot of problems with the show that you're doing because 
I don't know, I guess people don't have anything better to do in their lives, but this happens everywhere. I think we probably all had a, an experience with this. Um, and so when we're selecting shows and we're working on our dramaturgy protocol, then we need to consider these audiences. And when we develop our specific dramaturgy protocol and what we're going to do to help bring our students and our community into the work we're doing is we need to consider what information does my students, then does my staff, does the school, does the audience and the community at large need to know about the show we're doing and about the point of view we are taking on this show. So for your students, obviously we're going to go in deepest, right? They need to understand this. So, cause they are going to be intimately working with these characters, with this story and crafting a similar vision to what you are attempting to do through communicating this wonderful story. So with our students, when we think about this, you have to consider when you structure out how your research is going to go, is I always say zoom out and go really big first and then narrow in. That's nothing that's like, wow, Lindsay, I've never heard that idea around research before, right? Like it's very obvious, but so many times um, when I'm working with educators, they start with like, with things that are like, oh my gosh, I have to figure out this like exact prop or like we have to like figure out like how this doorknob needs to be accurate to the time period. And I'm with you, but we got to start bigger because we got to figure out which battles we're going to fight within this. Um, so when we look at bigger, where I always love to start is looking at obviously your point of view and then figuring out what things within the story help support your point of view. So whether, so if we're going to do Les Mis, let's use that as an example. So I was involved on a production of Les Mis where I was the dramaturg, so it's easy for me to talk through that protocol. So what I did is I worked with the director and her point of view coming into the show is she wanted to explore how we fight systems of oppression and specifically how young people fight systems of oppression throughout history. That's a very different take on that story as opposed to like the idea of forgiveness or the idea of connection or like, or the idea of like historical reenactment, um, which I have worked on other productions and had that. And I was like, okay, weird, not weird, amazing. Please have me, let's grow through this protocol. So when I was doing that, I had to look within the text to find out, okay, what moments support this idea of, of, your, of your point of view, and then going through and looking at what information are my students going to need to learn and also my staff in order to really get into that. So what we did is we went through and we first started looking at historical context. So really diving into that. Understand, I mean, with Les Mis, there's so much. Um, but we looked specifically at the French, from, from the French history from 1789 to 1848, and we looked at it through the lens of people fighting systems of oppression, which very easy to do because that's all the French wanted to do during that time. Um, and so, but we focused specifically on that so that we as a staff could get very clear and not get mixed up <laughs> in all of the French history that was happening around this show. So we looked at how that was, that was relevant throughout the historical timeline. Then we broke that down more. How, does, how did society, do, uh, society uh, um, install systems of oppression and how did people fight against it? What were social norms? What, what kind of, um, like, what was the societal structure that we were working in, which in, with France is really, or Paris in specific, is very interesting because of the layout of the city. Um, and then we had our students start to um, research from there. Um, we, we broke it down into different areas. So um, once we have this, like, more broad idea of where we're going to start, then is, that's when I really like involving my students. So I have a base knowledge, but I don't have time um, to, to put together a dramaturgy packet necessarily when I'm teaching a show, unless I get an opportunity to, you know, work on it for a year and I can devote some time. Most of us don't have that time. And if we can bring dramaturgy alive to our students, it's a lot more fun. Um, and so what we'll do is I generally start 
I have a, a, um, a lesson plan, which actually I will just pull up um, for you guys right now because it, um, and you guys will also be able to get a copy of this. Just give me one moment. No, no, no. Oh my gosh, I feel like my computer is like going in overdrive all the time because <laughs> it's just, it has decided to stop working as well as I would like it to. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Okay. Okay, so this um this were this um this lesson is available on our um, on our website. And so it walks you through what we were just talking about um, and understanding the time period of the show, um, when it was actually written and when, when it takes place um, and looking at um, what customs, what ideas are gonna be different from our, or what, for our students. Because I mean, there's all kinds of shows, right? Even if you do a show from the 1950s, say you're gonna do Bye Bye Birdie. The idea of getting pinned means nothing nowadays, right? So if you're like, and now you get pinned, your kids might be like, what does this even mean? Or they might be like, okay, cool, we get to sing the telephone hour, and that's super, super fun. And they don't think about what they're actually talking about. Um, so thinking about those things, and also looking at if there's any specific vocabulary or allusions in the script, um, looking at the location of the show, looking at the central topics and themes. Um, I won't go through every single one of these specifically because you can um, get a copy of this, but it gives you a really great base for you personally to go off of. You can also do this work with your students from right from the get-go and have them start to generate these ideas. I always say it's really important for you to have a base knowledge coming in because if you're like, well, I don't know, we're doing how to succeed today. I haven't done any of my own research and then you're not gonna be able to steer your students at all. Um, so then what I, I, I love to do with my students is to do a rush research, like a rush research project where they have between 15 and 30 minutes and they are divided into small groups and their goal is to find as much information as they possibly can around one specific area. So the groups that I usually will always split everybody into is um, having them look at script vocabulary and illusions. So getting kids to just go through underline every word they don't understand, every illusion that they, that even regards if they understand it or not, um, that's there. And then they compile a list. Um, having them look at a historical timeline of the politics, I always add 10 years before the show and five years after if it's deeply rooted in politics. But even if you are doing something, example, again, like like Bye Bye Birdie, it is important if you think about that because that show is talking about changing societal norms. So if you're going to talk about the change from the nuclear family and from like this really like puritanical standpoint of like what women are supposed to do, your kids have to understand that point of view so that they can see where the trends are being changed. Um, so looking at the political side of what's going on, looking at the societal side of what's going on, and then if there's any specific events or cultural phenomenons that take place in your show. So let's use Bye Bye Birdie again for an example. Looking at the emergence of, um, of Elvis Presley, right? That's really, really going to be, to be important for our students to understand. The idea of like, what does, what does pinning mean? What does dating look like in this time period? Um, all of those things are, you can split your kids into smaller groups, as, as many groups as you want um, to research these specific things. But I would say like, if you're going to have kids like do the political stuff, you could, you could have two groups of students, like one doing 1940 to 1950, and then another group doing 1950 to 1955, or however you want to split that. Like, don't give them too much, but then they work all together quickly to create a, like, as much research as possible. Then what we'll do, I always have my students do, is have them come back together and redistribute themselves into new small groups where one person from each of the initial small groups is represented in the circle so that then they can share out their information together. Um, so then everybody starts to come and understand things. There's one expert in each group. And then um, 
I always like to have the students um, come together and decide what else do we need to research. Once we ignite this idea within them that theater is so much more than just performing and so much more than just the characters that are there, that's how we get them excited. Especially we need, it is our job as theater teachers to prove the relevancy of this material to our students. And I'm not saying that like you have to like come up with an entire PowerPoint and thesis statement, but it's our job to pick material if we go back to that model of audience that really excites our kids or find an entry point that really excites our kids and that they can understand how what they're doing can impact their world, how they can, theater can change the world and what they're going to do to bring their community in with this material and hopefully change people's hearts um, for the better. Um, and so once we can do that, kids are in. Not every single kid in your classroom is going to be into that. Not every kid is going to. But the majority, if you can get them excited, then you can get them to really dig into the meat of the material. So once we have that initial research, then I have the students decide what other, re what other information do we need to know? What else do we need additional information to really be able to dig into the show? We make a list and then I have a committee of researchers always when I work with students where their job is to continue the research. And those are real, those kids always do it because they're like excited about it. Um, and then together they continue that research, but we have an ongoing research or and dramaturgy packet because those kids have compiled all that research. I have them do it right in Google Docs. They send it over and I quickly put it together. It's not pretty, it, that doesn't matter. As long as you can have something that is in the, the, in the room with you guys during rehearsal, it's going to be wonderful. So I think that the biggest takeaway from anything that we are doing with dramaturgy and how we get our students excited is we have to structure it in a way that makes it easy for them to digest, but also exciting and interesting and teaches and shows the importance of how this research then comes back out onto the stage. Um, the final thing I just want to say, and we can talk about this if people are interested, otherwise we, def we do these uh, workshops quite frequently, so we can have you guys sign up for those. Um, but then when we think about the other circles, so when we think about our school community, about our, our audience that's going to be there, our anticipated audience, and our community at large, we also need to figure out how we're going to bring this information to them. So if we just start out with your number four, your audience, if we start there, and if you have a point of view about, um, I worked on a production of Mamma Mia, and um, the, the point of view that the director wanted to take with that was the idea of how, when we, the, the impact of holding secrets, and what that means when parents hold secrets from their children, and what does that manifest like in the world? Um, I mean, that is a very deep <laughs> take on Mamma Mia, because that's, it's just fun, 70s music, right, usually, but no, this was interesting, but if you have that take and you're not telling anybody, no one's going to know. So how can you bring that information into your lobby? How can you create um, interactive options for your, your, for your audience? Like one of the things that we did was had a, like a wall where folks were able to have, um, where they, we asked like, what is a secret that you found? that changed your that changed your life and they can write it down anonymously and put it up and then you have like and if you have like interesting ways that have like the paper or colors you can make like a pretty collage that's like interesting to look at and it's an art installation after you're done um also can you put together other information about the show like that school they did a timeline where they looked at what was going on in politics and society and then in music history and how that all paralleled together so that the audience and the students could better understand like the motivation behind ABBA's music and behind disco, which was really cool um, and something I didn't really know a lot about either. Um, and so there's lots of ways that you can bring that information to your audience so that they better understand it. Um, that show in particular was really important how they messaged it to the community at large because Mama Me, everybody thinks it's fun until you see a bunch of high school students doing it and you're like, OMG, what is happening? Um, and so being on top of communicating that information out to your local newspapers, out to, to whoever, being very upfront and saying, hey, we're doing this show with this specific idea, 
behind it and we are doing xyz to help bring that to light so if you can partner with folks if you can with like community organizations if you can bring in speakers or you can find other avenues in first of all your newspapers are going to want to cover that because it's an interesting story heck of a lot more than the local high school this weekend is doing this show um so you can get more press but also you get ahead of the horse so that you don't have to email get as many nasty emails or concerns from folks um and then finally the last thing too about like how do we apply this dramaturgical information to our school so what activities can we find to bring this information to our school can we collaborate with any of our other curriculums to to bring this to life one of the things that was super interesting um was uh when i was working in seattle there was a high school that did guys and dolls and they involved their entire technical education program in that. They had the students research, um, they had them research architecture of the time. And they, so they drew up blueprints that then were used for the set. And they also got students to come in and build the set. Um, they also had some students, uh, their like mechanics class, um, look up car mechanics uh, and like, I don't know this stuff at all, but like basically the kids restored a car that then was used on the stage. Um, and to make it look like it was from that time period. That's a really cool way to bring your students in, into this, in your school into it. Can you part, almost every show's got some history behind it. Can you partner with your history departments so that there's more, so that the kids can understand why we're doing this work more than doing a school assembly, and, which always has like a little dicey, with if the kids are going to like it or if they're going to be like, this is stupid and I hate theater and make fun of your students. Um, or doing more than just like selling tickets in the school lunch, which both things are important, but we have to find ways to really capture our students and our, com our school community's interest. And so that should always be the goal with dramaturgy, I believe, is how can we use this information to deepen our students' impact and, and interest in the work, but also, our community so that we can prove relevancy. Okay, I just talked a lot. I'm going to stop talking. And um, I would love to hear from you guys if you got, if there's any questions or anything that you want me to go over a little bit more from that. Um, but I'd also love to hear what you guys are working on with your students or if you have any dramaturgy that you are planning to do with your kiddos. You guys can go ahead and just unmute yourselves um, and we can just have a community conversation. I will check the chat and see if anybody has any questions. Um, I'll go ahead and um, I'll, I'll say something real quick. Um, I have not um, done done any dramaturgy in my classroom one of the reasons why i wanted to i just wanted to get a little brush up on some of it and um i plan to now do some projects do some stuff here um during this time of um online and distant learning because it's a great you know, researching is such a great opportunity right for your team to be able to do this exact thing that you're talking about so I'm really excited to dive in and see how it goes. So thank you. Thank oh, you. great. Awesome. I'm happy it's helpful, Harrison. That's that's really good to hear. Um, and obviously, if there's other things that we can do, just please let us know. I put the link to the, I think this link will work. I just I just put it in the, the chat to that dramaturgy lesson. But obviously, it'll also be copied in, um, in the email that we send as well. Um, Cindy, I am so very happy that you put this, this comment in the chat. It's one of my favorite things to answer. So Cindy said that she's concerned about finding time for this when rehearsal schedules are so tight. Absolutely. This is always my biggest uphill battle whenever I do <laughs> dramaturgy workshops because schedules are so very tight within our work. This comes down to a personal choice as an educator of where you want to invest your time and what your purpose as an educator is throughout this process. Um, there is no right answer. I, I firmly believe that if you invest time into your students and into your process and focus on the process rather than on the product, 
your product will turn out. Um, the other thing that I always say as well is that we have to remember that this is, these are students. This is community-based theater. Community-based theater has this extremely important role in the world and I think is the most important form of theater because it actually has the ability to impact and connect with your community in a way that commercial, professional Broadway theater cannot because commercial theater has to appeal to the masses. It has to be something that they can find a bunch of people who are willing to spend a hundred plus bucks on a ticket for and earn back revenue. We don't have to do that as a community. Yes, it's important that we need to get revenue and I know everybody's budgeting systems are different, but we should be focusing instead of on the product on the stage, on the impact both for our students and the community. So rehearsal schedules are tight. There are plenty of things that we can do within our rehearsal process to help streamline. Um, I'm happy to talk about that stuff too. Like how can we streamline our process so that our students are thinking about this? And this is not to say that I think anybody in this like space doesn't know how to do that or that your process isn't correct. I just think it right now while we're sitting at home and we don't have a program, maybe it's time for us, like, we can spend some time thinking about what are my priorities in the rehearsal room and with my program and how do I structure that time in. Um, I, when I do shows, I, I take an entire three hours each week to do enrichment. That works for how I structure shows. I, I know it can work. I've worked with other theater teachers to help them restructure it, but it really comes down to how you're going to spend your time. And also the one thing I will say too, is that when your students are invested, and they can really dig into the show and see that they are making an impact with their work, their work ethic is going to, to really change. And they will start to see this as important in a way that they didn't see before. So if you take this time and invest, I truly believe you'll see their returns because your students will be more invested in what they're doing and they will understand what they're doing, <laughs> which is huge because how many times do we get to tech week and the kids are like, what is the story about? Like, or like, when do I come on stage? Or what is the scene order? I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> How do you not know this? We're telling the same story. What's going on? Right? So, um, so by doing this investment, you can definitely do it. Um, also, Cindy, that, um, or to everybody, that, that, um, that protocol that I just went through um, and that lesson can be done in about two hours. Um, so really, if you, can, if you can spend that time, if you can give up one rehearsal even, I think if you give up three, you're gonna be in such amazing shape because you can spend one rehearsal talking about dramaturgy. You can have one rehearsal where your students have like an entire conversation about the show and the societal impacts and what they hope their impact is through the show. And then the third one, you can have everybody work on creating those um, elements that can be displayed in the lobby. Um, and then if you break your students into committees where they work on this outside of school, I think you can really do it. So it's doable. You just have to trust yourself and believe you can do it and not get scared by fear that you won't be able to. But we can, I, I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody has questions or anything. I guess like, let's pause there. Does anybody have any thoughts on that or more questions or want to be like, Lindsay, you're a crazy person. I can't do this. Not at all. Um, I was just going to say, um, I've come at it in two other slightly different ways. Amazing. Uh, so when I've been looking at a small cast show in particular, mm -hmm. I've had a group of students who are maybe not in the cast, but are so very interested in being involved. Maybe they're not handy with costumes or sets, but I've made like, a they've been like our play experts. You know what I mean? We Love talk about that. the amateurs as the play experts. And that group of students actually do a lot of that preliminary research and then bring it to us in a rehearsal. And then that actually then gets the actors very interested because they're like, oh, I didn't understand that this meant that or what was happening. And so it sort of gives students who maybe aren't in the cast a venue or people that are shy a venue. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also have had good luck when I was at a very small school because I was able to work with an English teacher and we sort of um, did had the English students doing 
uh, a small project, you know, just for a couple days in their English class, yeah. where they had to look at the author and the time period. And a lot of my students were in the English classes, obviously. So um, they sort of did it from that route. And then it spilled over and they brought it to rehearsal. And some of them were like, well, I'm going to do some extra research on this thing or that thing. And, um, you know, it really kind of got them started and they could see how it kind of also related to um, school. So from a parental standpoint, it was kind of helpful because they were like, oh, that's okay. useful in English class. So um, it sort of made the, the connection there too. That is so awesome. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing that. With, it's, it's Laura, right? I'm remembering from this. Okay, great. It's on me. Sure. Um, that's a really, I love that. And because we're always looking right in school for how we can involve more students. And that would be really cool. I know I would have loved to have had that opportunity because I hate performing on stage, which thought that was the only way I could do anything in the world. So um, I think that's really, really wonderful. Um, we're planning to do. Oh, I don't know. Go ahead, John. Um, we're, we're planning to do something similar next year, I believe, in my school where we pick a play and they look at it from the history classes, would look at it from a history point of view, the English classes from, from, from looking, breaking it down, drama, of course, working with tech, the music class, doing the music for it. So all tying it together to, to actually have a cross-curricular, like specifically chosen um, play that where all of the students say in grade 10 are are going to work on together. So when it goes up, everyone has a piece in it. And the art students would do the, um, art class would do the props and the costumes design and all of that stuff. So we're looking at um, pulling that together. The other thing I wanted to mention is that at my school, um, we write original musicals. And I would say that that is a great way to work in dramaturgy because they have to understand. And when they're writing it, they really start to, argue and get really passionate because it's theirs they get really passionate about why and what's the point and what are we trying to say and uh so if you haven't written with your students i would say that that's a like it seems hard and it's been a big learning process for me over 18 years but um i would say that that is probably my biggest learning in terms of dramaturgy because um they start to learn what the questions are that they have to ask to understand to get that across to the audience when it's given to them they don't have to ask those questions because they're they can just read it and and repeat it and right. they don't necessarily have to understand it they, they have to sound like they understand it they don't really have to understand it at a deep level and i think when you write with them and you keep asking them well why what's the point how does that connect to what we just did before or how does it connect to the next character or whatever then they have to have a deeper understanding and i think that's what our our job is as educators Absolutely. Jen, I have a question. So have you seen, like, as you've gone through this process, like over the years, have your students then in the rehearsal process when it's not necessarily just original work, or even I guess then like able to make more choices on stage and rely less on you to micromanage? Yeah. And also like they get really connected to things so that they don't <laughs> let go of. Like they, they really make choices because they believe it, because it's coming from a certain place instead of somebody telling what they should do it's like no I know my person is like this because because that's because they're because of the history and what I learned about my character and what I'm what what they would be feeling um so yeah because they know they know a deeper they have a deeper understanding and and I would say together they have an understanding like everyone's like oh yeah that's exactly why you would do that right because yes da, da, da. and they and also like I spent a lot of my rehearsals we spent a lot of our rehearsals arguing and talking about the play because because they're like this you wouldn't do that yes i would you know like, <laughs> whatever like that doesn't make sense in the time period or whatever like they get really passionate about and invested in the play because they are they are it it is part of them yeah well and you're also creating such an amazing explorative exploratory uh, culture and community mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. really is going to get your students to like not just be consumers of theater when they're older that's like what's the newest Disney musical let's go spend our money all on that maybe they'll actually start to be able to understand the art form and I love that um mm -hmm. uh, uh Cindy Jen has a question and so does Trisha um how did you get the other teachers on board um to do this yeah I mean 
I, I, I work in a very um, tight knit school. I would say that most of the teachers have been there for 18 years like I have, and we're just all very tight and um, they're just, they, they know me, I know them, you know, we're break it down for them in a way that is digestible. Um, and also like, we, I also work in a community that is um, low income socioeconomic issues. And I think we're all trying to find ways to engage them in mm. new ways. And also um, like, we all, we are all there to kind of give our kids the most and the best that we can. And so that's the driving force. And um, so we're not territorial or, you know, whatever. Like I, I, I yeah. feel like people are willing, willing to be creative and look at things in any way because, and I know that's not the case in every school. It's just because at my school, we're like grasping at straws to, to kind of make things work for these kids. So. Yeah. Well, and I think that, I think that, this, I'm sure that people will be like, no, Lindsay, this is wrong. But like most schools, I think that you can work on slowly integrating this. So like all of a sudden being like, hello, every core subject, would you like to support the theater department's production of Peter Pan? No, they don't. <laughs> um, yeah. But if you can slowly start to integrate it. So like maybe first talking to the art department, that's a really easy connection. Um, to do like an art gallery or something like that. And then slow, I mean, history and English are going to be your next easiest um, because there can be some tie-ins. Harrison said um, to see, to look at the books that your students are having to read and to see if there's a play form of that. That's a really yeah. great idea. Um, and business as well. Business always likes to do things like posters and, and like front of house kind of stuff. Yeah. I love that. Jen, where are you located? Um, in... Ontario, Canada. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I was, I was just wondering. Yeah. Okay, cool. I was, yeah, I was trying to get, was, so that's great though, that like you guys have, that your school has that community. Um, and, and Laura just said, even if there's a play that takes place in the same, same time period or era as the books that they're reading in class, that's a really yeah. good um, option too. I mean, also everybody has like, probably not you, Jen, but like if you're in America, like American history, right? Everybody has to take that at some point. That's a pretty easy tie-in because um, there's so many shows, so many that have a tie-in to American history. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's super Thanks. inspirational, I think, to hear about for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else have questions or thoughts Um, I see another over here from Alyssa. So Alyssa says for the ongoing dramaturgy research team, is it better to present their research to the cast and crew at the beginning of the process or ongoing throughout? Um, Laura, you also are a dramaturg, so I would love your opinion on this as well. Um, I, I like doing the majority of, I would say like I would front load, I do like let's see, 60% right in the beginning during like table work time, um, but not all at once, not be like, and here is your pocket. Congratulations, learn all this information and don't comprehend any of it. Um, so uh, I, do, I do a lot during the table work, but then I also like to space it out as we go through the process, like two other dramaturgical check-ins where they can continue to share their ongoing research so that the students remember oh yes, this is what we're doing. We can really focus on the meat of the play and that because at the core, we're not putting together a light show. We're not putting together a costume parade. Um, those are separate things. We are telling a story. And so remembering that story and bringing that to them as well. Laura, what do you do? Um, I would say it's similar with maybe 50% of all the basics up front. You know, there's certain things that about the time period or about the language or about the characters, particularly if it's a historical setting. But if it's not, even so, um, maybe about the author that they want to know. Uh, mm -hmm. And then at some point, I also like to, even though we're used to theater kids not being shy, I do at a certain point, um, probably on my second discussion of the sort of tie-ins, uh, like to give out everybody just like an index card or something so that they can write down one thing they'd like to know about the play oh, or one yeah. thing they don't get about the play. Mm -hmm. Even if we're used to them being like outspoken kids, sometimes they're just like, I really don't get why this character doesn't just X. 
and then it could be something societal, it could be something historical. And so I do like to um, open that up because then that gives, you know, students or myself, whoever's doing dramaturgy, um, a chance to really look into those specific things uh, mm -hmm. and make it also sort of the students are inspiring the questions about it. Um, one other thing I was thinking about is that I've also expanded a little bit my um, uh, questioning when you were talking about those initial questions, learning about the author and what their and author's intent. Um, you know, I was working on that, at, I was sort of working with someone on a show um, who was directing it. And at one point they said, they said, well, ultimately I'm never going to know the author's intent because even if they did an interview about it 20 years later, they could have changed their mind. So they said, so I talk about that, but then just as important, if you are doing Brigadoon, I mean, what are people getting out of it today? You yeah. know, you really have to do the second step of what are your students getting out of it? Because it's not what I'm getting out of it. What I get out of Hamilton is different than what my high schoolers get out of Hamilton. I mean, right. so there, there does have to be sort of, you know, I think this added level of what today does it mean? Yeah. If it is totally sexist today, what does that mean? Why are we doing it? You know, so yeah. um, all those things. That's a really good point. And that is really usually pretty easily researched if it has had a large scale revival. Um, th there's going I mean, Kiss Me Kate, that revival, you can find so many articles written on it. Oklahoma, endless. You pretty much could put together like a book and read that for like four hours. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. And I think you touched on something too that I think is worth mentioning. It's sort of dramaturgically related. Um, but as teachers, it's also, and as directors, it is always our job to justify the work that we're doing, especially the problematic moments within it. I don't think it's acceptable for us to say, oh, well, it was written in 1950, so that's how it was done in 1950, and that's okay, because it's not. It really isn't. Like, Anything Goes is a really good example. It is not okay to do Anything Goes and to have kids dressed in yellow face or just totally ignore that story point because you can't ignore it. Um, it's there. You can't change it. So you have to call it out. And it's also really important that sometimes there is work that we just can't do because we don't have the right students and we, we don't have the right lens to go into it. So especially with some really shows that have a lot of sexism in it, one way that you can combat that potentially is to flip that on its side and to like really look at how we empower women from like a uh, gender or like sexual like advanced standpoint that might be really tough with your students and also is a really tough line as a director to to go so i love what you're saying laura i think it's really important to understand what we're getting out of it now and to find that um, that way in. I mean, one of my favorites to research is The uh, the King and I. It's a show I'd never do um, just because it's so massive and I'm not a big like massive musical person. Um, but that you can read how that director, he had the permission from uh, the estate, but how he reworked that show. And you can watch it on Broadway HD right now, how they updated it and ways to make it acceptable um, for modern audiences. So that's also something to think about. Awesome. Any other things that anyone is looking at or ideas that when we were talking was like, hey, that's a really cool idea. Um, I'm thinking of doing this that you want to share with the group. Well, if anybody has ideas, we're doing Big Fish in fall. So oh my God, Cindy, are you kidding me? No, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Sorry, I sorry. Cindy works in my hometown, and I do a lot of work back there still. So, I'm so excited, <laughs> over excitement. That's but amazing. It's really easy to dramaturge something like Les Mis, or Hamilton, or how do you do Big Fish? I mean, it's 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 such an one of the things I love about it is such an interesting cross between fantasy and reality, and they're all on the stage at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, how would you work that in? Yeah, that is a really good question. So um, I would have to have, and if you have, actually, if you have a copy, Cindy, and you want to chat about this more, obviously, you know, I love Wasa and I love musicals. So I think this would be a really fun show to do a lot of dramaturgical work. And Big Fish is one that you have to specifically come in with a clear 
lens that you're telling the story through because otherwise it's just like a magical fantasy land which I think is part of the reason that it didn't do well on Broadway because they were like and sets that move and people are like cool what's the story um so but because it is based in reality what could be really interesting for you to think about Cindy is focusing on those moments that it does take place in reality and looking at the historical moments that it takes place within and understand and you could also do a whole um dramaturgical like lobby work or even with your students of adapting like how have fairy tales or like how has fantasy been inspired by real events so like you could look at like what inspired c.s lewis to write the chronicles of narnia you could look at what inspired jk or not jk well jk rowling to write harry potter but i was thinking more jr tolkien um um and why he wrote um lord of the rings and those are those aren't exactly the same kind of fantasy but you could use those as springboards for your students to understand um how this element actually works and it's not just like and now we're having fun on stage and making a bunch of things fall from the sky um which is what it will look like otherwise exactly and and i'm also a big proponent too of like well especially because um I mean, you're, you're working on growing your program, which is wonderful. Right. Um, the more that you can prove relevancy through your work, you're going to be able to grow it quicker and get more funding from your school district and all those other things. Um, but so if you can use Big Fish and your students actually know the story they're saying on stage and can say things, if you can get sound bites from your kiddos, that's like more than, I love it because I get to hang out with all my friends. And I love it because I love to sing on stage. <laughs> um, <Right>? There's more. <laughs> that you can get in big fish has that in so many ways. Um, that's what I would say, but we could, we could, um, we could chat about that more too. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I I feel like the big, the major thing that I would want to get across is the relationship between the father and the son. That to me is, is the biggie. And what like part of it? Um, uh, the redemption of it, how they, they, uh, fought you know butted heads for so long and how they managed to come together I think Um, that is beautiful and I think rather than so this is a good um that's a really great example Cindy of I think sometimes when we come up with our lens we can go really broad and be like I want to focus on this relationship but I think if we can distill it down to one word um because you used specifically the word redemption not the word forgiveness not the word acceptance. And those two things are gonna manifest differently on the stage than redemption. And how else can you find moments of redemption specifically in the script, as opposed to forgiveness, because that also is there and so is acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that'd be a really good base to start from. Yeah. (laughs) Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I got very excited. Um, Trisha, do (laughs) you mean that you have a question or do you have a request out for Big Fish? Sorry, maybe you're going to type it. I just want to make sure. Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> it says you're unmuted too. Um, maybe you have a, do you have a request out for it? Oh, or, it might be her oh. headphones. Um, oh, if, you're... They're, if they're in the jack and the microphone's not working, it might, I would just maybe unplug them, try that. No. <laughs> Do you just want to type it? Or no, move. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, Trisha, if you, if you want to type it, we can come back to that if you want. Um, Allison, did you, did anybody else have anything that they wanted to share? I saw your, your mic was unmuted for a bit. Oh, no, okay. Okay. Any other thoughts? Or, I mean, that was fun, Cindy, to talk about your show for like five minutes. Does anybody else have a specific show that they're looking at doing that you want any feedback or ideas on how to go through that? This isn't really dramaturgy centric. I'm just curious, is anyone working on shows with your students remotely? That's a great question. Like, are you rehearsing remotely? Did you just put everything on hold? Allison, you're rehearsing? Yeah, actually, we're going to perform it on 
And I don't know if you were here earlier. I was explaining that, but um, oh, sorry, I was gonna, a little late. <laughs> we're gonna like film it via Zoom. Oh no, that's fine. No, I was just like talking about like the plan for um, I was supposed to do Aladdin Kids, and we also have Charlotte's Web and an original um show that we wrote. Um, so all were supposed to be performed in April and May. Um, definitely for Aladdin Kids, I've decided we're gonna we're gonna film scenes on Zoom. We're gonna film the dances on Zoom, and then we're gonna have the kids record themselves singing their parts, sending their vocal tracks in, and we're gonna like just put it all together in like a movie for them to keep. And um, yeah, cause, cause the, the rescheduling and the, the venues and the uncertainty and, you know, trying to find a date that works for everybody, it's just impossible. I'm kind of doing the same thing with showcase cause we teach classes and piano and acting and dance and all kinds of art forms. So we're letting the kids sign up. If they want to do our virtual showcase, they can do like a one-on-one -on -one with their teacher film something that is an assignment to them, get feedback, and then we'll put that together as a virtual showcase for them to keep as well. So I'm a little different because I don't work at a school. So I don't have like English class and all that to like collaborate with, but, um, but yeah. We, um, I teach middle school theater and um, we're right in the middle of working on Frozen Junior. Um, and uh, we're supposed to perform April 16th. So I guess last week oh, wow. um, and um, I've tried to meet with my cast on Zoom, but um, a lot of our kids still don't have um, internet or computer access and stuff. Um, but I really like the idea um, of recording on Zoom. And so literally as you were talking, I sent out a text to all my kids and was like, okay, I think I have an idea. Um, if you're interested, let me know, you know, if not, we can work around it. And, um, but I like the idea of giving them the challenge of, you know, creating the backdrops at home or like, you know, putting together their costumes. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing you can do on zoom is like, you can upload photos um, yeah. Yeah. As, as backgrounds. So yeah. like through my genius little video guy, he was like, we can just like, put pictures up that we want the background to be and they can all like dance in front of that and it'll work with some of their computers some of them if they have like a computer that's too old or whatever um it's a little bit of a challenge but we can, can we're gonna try to borrow make it. your guy can everybody borrow your <laughs> video guy is that i keep him so busy he's, <laughs> he's like making commercials it's like crazy yeah allison if you guys are not allison you should plug your company because you guys are doing crazy stuff online right now <laughs> Um, yeah, well, and okay, so we actually offer a free service right now. We're going to continue that through May. So I just have my staff members once a week put out content, whether it be like an acting class, a quick piano lesson, a dance class, and it's called Wonderland TV. So if you want to go subscribe to Wonderland Performing Arts and help me boost up my YouTube page, I would be so grateful. Um, but it's basically just like little classes. We try to like get a variety of ages and a variety of subjects. Um, just on there for free for people right now while we figure everything out. And I think we had a really good brainstorming session today of like how we're going to move forward with the summer programs because my studio is pretty small and I don't think we can safely social distance even if we sanitize like crazy, wear gloves, wear masks. I don't feel comfortable getting these kids in close quarters together just yet. Um, and I have a new studio being built that's 10,000 square feet. So once that is finished in the fall, um, I'll be able to maybe have like six to 10 kids in a class and feel okay about it. But in my small little baby space, I don't feel good about it. I'm going to continue the online game for now. That is super cool. I love that. Thanks, Allison, for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, also, um, if we want to circle back to, actually, no, before I do that, um, next week, we're actually going to have, um, I'm confirming the guests that are going to be on, so I don't want to, like, say that these are the people, and then, like, <laughs> they can't, um, but we have some folks who are going to come on and be brainstorming about ways that we can potentially look at doing work um, in the summer and fall and spring next year if we have to, like if this continues to go on and how we can bring our stuff online. Um, so that's going to be next week's specific focus. So that would totally be if you're considering this and we're, our whole goal next month 
is to, so next month our focus is all on how can we continue connection for our students during this time and like bringing them together through our program. But then in July or um, June, we're going to be focusing on, okay, so this might be our reality for a bit. And how do we, um, how do we actually still make art and not just put a bunch of people on Zoom and read? Because yeah. that is not art. <laughs> That's a bunch of people on Zoom. I, I do have one of my staff members reading um, some like perusals of some plays that have been written to perform online. Like they're specifically written that way. And I don't know what that looks like, but yeah. um, there was, I don't know, there's something about like, like a cupcake, something or other that she was reading today. And like, I've been getting emails about them and I get it. It's not ideal and it's not actual theater, <laughs> but it could bridge a gap for us. Yeah. We're, we're, well, we're, I can say in the meantime, I teach an introduction to theater course for non-majors and um, we, we usually read the plays in class. So for our one act play unit, I was like, well, we're doing sorry, wrong number because <laughs> that, you know, having been, it was actually something that, you know, is so, all the characters are so isolated, but yeah, it's very difficult, especially I mean, that's a different situation because those are not theater majors, but trying to draw them in. Yeah. You know. I feel like I just, I just got an email and I can't remember if it was from Play Scripts or MTI or... Play Scripts or, is the one that I think I was talking about. Okay. Somebody just sent out a whole list like of today. numbers that are written specifically to be done on Zoom. Yeah, theater folk did a few too. Okay. It just came out like today with theirs. I'm not gonna lie, it's all starting to run together. I know, there's so much out. So what I was, agree, but yeah. What was um, the one that you said, Alyssa? Theater, theater folk. folk. Mm -hmm. They just came out with three today. I got an email this morning. Um, yeah, beat by, I was going to actually talk about that, Cindy. Actually, Cindy, beat by the, the show must go on by them. Everest is doing in your area. And so if you want to show your school board that they should stop being dumb and let you do a show right now, you could say that one of your high schools is doing it. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little crass, but um, I mean- I might do that. You should, you should be like- <laughs> Everest gets to do it. <laughs> yeah, and they're doing it, they're doing it six or 12. Yeah, I know they are. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but I will say, I'm working on that show on The Show Must Go Online. I'm not sure how much educational value and like performance value you're going to get from your right. students with it. However, if you need something for your students to just get some creative energy out, it could be right. worth it for anybody that's like looking at these. But um, that's actually a really good segue because I wanted to bring up this article too. Um, there's this article been going um, around that maybe you guys have seen that's pretty controversial. I think it was in Medium where, the, where it's like entitled like, that basically artists should stop making art right now, um, theater artists specifically. Um, and I read it and I really resonated with it. Um, I can see if I can find it quickly as I'm explaining it, but basically what it was saying is theater is not meant to be online. It's just not like film, television, that's the medium it exists in. And so rather than forcing things awkwardly, I mean, I'm sure we've all seen the awkward like um a bunch of celebrities sitting around in bad lighting on zoom and reading articles or reading stuff which doesn't really do very much um rather than doing that kind of work instead if we can find ways to just be as artists and observe the world and like be here rather than forcing something online to where it doesn't fit and that is one thing that i also feel like is really applicable to us as educators um is right now, like, especially as theater educators, like what we're doing was never ever meant <laughs> to be done on, on, on Zoom, right? It was not. And so right now, instead, how can we foster our students' creativity? How can we have our students, like they don't have 400,000 rehearsals going on. They don't have to do, like, they don't have these insane schedules. So how can we teach our students right now to slow down and actually become artists and not just performers? And how can they, we start to say, okay, so you can't, 
we can't perform the play and that sucks. What other ways can we continue to be artistic and can we do these things that we love and how can we help build the future for these things? Because that is going to be really important and we are going to be, as theater teachers, a part of the national conversation in a way I don't think we often get to because we are the ones that are having to actually adapt this in a way from a like educational standpoint. We aren't going to stop having theater classes at all. Like that's not a thing, right? Um, so how can we actually help impact the future of this? And is it doing things like, like these quick shows that we're putting together that can be done on Zoom? Maybe. Or what are the other options? I think that's something just like to throw. I just put the article link in here and you might read it and hate me and feel like, Lindsay, you're dumb. I disagree with you. And that's cool. Um, but I also think it gives you a lot of permission. I've been feeling really overwhelmed. Like I've been trying to write a musical for two years and now I have the time and I just got it laid out on my wall. Like, <laughs> cause I'm like, this is all I can do. Um, and so, yeah, I think, and Jeffrey, you said, that's a really good point. Like, how can we be using this time to have our students write about the world around us? Or how can we find ways for our students to like explore the world around us through other work? I mean, right now, rent has not been relevant in a lot of ways to our students. I don't know how many students of mine like refuse to even like glance at it or they think it's some archaic dinosaur. That is a show right now that they can actually pull parallels to might not be appropriate for your students. Um, but there are shows out there that maybe these, these, these ideas seemed far away, but now they're close to us because this is our world. So yeah, I would also say it depends on, um, like I, since I'm teaching some theater classes, I, I can't not do anything. Right, <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. So, so like, that sort of thing, about? but, um, uh, something related to what Jeffrey said about writing about the world around us, and I won't go on and on. I feel like I'm talking too much, but um, I'm doing actually um, uh, I'm doing actually a documentary monologue project where we watched um, like obviously you wouldn't necessarily with middle school kids, but my my high school kids watched some excerpts from the Exonerated and the Laramie Project and Anna Denver Smith pieces, and they're all just picking somebody real and researching that person and then writing a monologue. Some of them are writing it as that person. Some of them are writing it as someone else talking about that person. Um, but it really, it's nice and open the project because they can really pick, um, you know, um, anybody that they're interested in, you know, it can be anywhere out there. And, uh, you know, we went through like a lot of different choices because initially I had like, three people that were like, I'm gonna do Michelle Obama. I said, well, let's think of all the people we can do so that we're all doing someone, you know, different, um, as wonderful as she is. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it gave them a lot to um, choose from. I think that that's a really great way, though, that we can be doing theater online right now. You know, I mean, also, I think you joined after Laura. I was talking about how um, the uh, Joe San, uh, Salvatore from NYU, I don't know if you know him just because you're out. Yeah, he's going to be doing a workshop um, next month about how to do verbatim theater right now in the world um, since he runs the verbatim lab uh, over there. So I think that verbatim lab, or excuse me, verbatim theater is kind of like, we have a really cool opportunity right now to be really developing that work, which Alyssa, you said you were doing as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yes, because yeah, we can't just do nothing. We can't just be like, let's meditate on art and like in our minds. No, we don't have time for that either. <laughs> Gotta get something done. Um, but yeah. Um, I also just, uh, yeah, I just want to, we have a few more minutes. Does anybody else have any comments or thoughts or anything like that? Oh, good, Cindy. I like that you like that quote. That's what I always say. I never call my students performers. Um, I have a blog coming out. I finally got back to doing those. That's all about like how right now we can actually retrain our students to be, or and, and ourselves to be artists and not performers. Um, because yeah, that's really important. Um, so, okay. So if nobody has any other thoughts. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so thank you guys all for coming. This has been wonderful. Um, I just, as I, I said a moment ago, um, I put over in the chat, the link to the verbatim performance lab over at NYU. That is a lot of really great resources for you as educators and some really interesting activities that you can do with your students. Some of them are political. 
if you want to steer away from that, which probably we shouldn't be doing politics with our high school students, maybe. Um, I think that that's a really great resource for you. Um, also, next week is our last um, of these brainstorming sessions for April. We are going to be doing more brainstorming sessions throughout May um, as well. Um, and we will get that, uh, that schedule out to you guys next week. We'll announce all of that. In the meantime, um, a couple other things I just want to mention. Um, we have um, some, oh, I'm going to put my dramaturgy lesson over quick. Um, but we also have some other stuff we're doing this month with Re Theater. We have a musical theater history class that's looking at the Rebellious History Musical Theater that is meeting on Thursdays. Um, we are doing our fourth class tomorrow. Um, but if you want to join us and you haven't before, that's totally fine because you can um, jump on in and we can send you the previous recordings. Tomorrow we're specifically going to be looking at the people who um, made musical theater and the people that defined it and the, how they rebelled against convention and society to do so. Um, so that's over in the chat as well. Um, if anybody is joining that joined us just because they found a link somewhere on the internet and you want a recording, um, feel free. I just put that link over there. Just go ahead and sign up. Um, we will send you the recording or if you are here and you don't need the recording, but you want to like hear more. We do a lot. We're doing a bunch of more work. So starting in May, so we can get all that information from there. And then finally, um, this month, we are doing pay what you can for all of our programming. Um, we actually not this month, we are doing this through the end of June and are looking at continuing this going forward. Um, if you would, if you are, if this has been helpful, if any of our programming has and you feel compelled, Please, um, there's no pressure, but I'm gonna put there, we are taking any donations or any pay what you can to help keep all of our staff on board um, and continue to bring you guys programming. But honestly, at the heart of everything that we do, we just wanna bring equitable opportunities to continue theater education and engagement through these crazy times. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that um, we also have a program called Spotlight. Several folks from that group are actually on this call um, today. And so Spotlight is a small curated community of educators on Facebook. Um, we do monthly master classes over there. Um, you get one-on-one -on -one consultation calls with me um, throughout the month. Uh, we also do like happy hours. We bring, we have a group of, group of mentors over there as well that are all professionals in the industry that are willing to do one-on-one -on -one consultations or else in the group um, do like chats. So it's a really cool community and it's not as big because we, we keep it pretty small. We're doing that as pay what you can. There's usually a $30 fee, um, but it's pay what you can and $0 is also totally great. We just want people there. So I put that link there. You have a cure, you have a bunch of information about um, uh, the, our previous master classes. You can access all that and some lesson plans and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you, this is helpful and you want to join us, I would love to have you guys there. Um, so, oh, great. Alyssa says that the one-on-one -on -one sessions are super helpful. So great. I'm glad. But anyways, thank you all so much for taking time out of your schedule. It just really shows how much you care about your students um, to be doing this because we're all sick of Zoom. So thank you. And I'm so happy to have met you all. And I just wish you health and happiness and that this all goes well. So um, I'm going to go ahead. And I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to stick around. Otherwise, I will see you guys all next week um, when we talk about what comes next and how do we build our programs after all this craziness. So, all right, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes. Good to see you. Yeah.